interested in talking um, in the fall, please let me know. I'll be uh, starting to get that schedule together fairly soon. Um, if you have questions, I think we're probably going to have to um, walk around the hand microphones again. This morning one looks like it's still not working. So please wait for the microphone to get to you before you start talking. Please work? No. No. Yeah. And we do have a few people hey, online, so. Oh, that's a problem. It is a problem. Yeah. yeah. So we do have people online, so uh, we can turn around the, the microphone if you got questions. So today uh, we have Shiv Siva Ram. Ah, yeah, okay, Siva go. Ramakrishna. There we go. As Brian said, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Right. Siva Ramakrishnan, who is going to give us an interesting talk. Okay. Um, positions are okay in terms of the camera. And, and where where are you from in the medical school? Uh, I'm okay. Yeah, I should have put that up there. Um, I'm in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology. Oh, great. Um, I have an appointment with the biophysics program, and uh -huh. I also have a joint appointment with biomedical engineering. Super. Yeah. Um, I've yeah, been right here. Hour. Yeah. Um, and just uh, uh, an, another note, basically, I've been, I've, you know, I'm an assistant professor at CDB. I've been here for about a little over three years. And cool. a lot of the work I'm going to tell you about is uh, some new techniques we've been actually building and using in my lab. Oh, welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you. Okay, so um, because this is, uh, you know, there's an emphasis on tools and technology, I'd like, rather than um, spend a lot of time on one particular story, I'd like to try and give you vignettes of what we've been doing and more in the context of technology. We're right across the street, um, and so, um, you know, I've interacted with Barry Grant in a signal transduction club, but we would like for other people to be aware of the technologies we use, and also we welcome people, um, exchange of uh, reagents, information, um, encourage people to use these technologies, and we're happy to facilitate the use of these technologies in your lab. So um, I first want to start by giving a brief outline of the research focus. Why are these technologies important in a biological context? What sort of questions do we try to think we can answer, rather than just have the emphasis being purely on the technology? And then go into our approaches, which is sort of more of a top-down, um, as I've highlighted for ERK, and bottom-up, which is using um, DNA nanotechnology. And depending upon the time, I may or may not be able to get through to the DNA nanotechnology part, although the ERK is the one that I want to emphasize because it's a relatively new technology. Um, I'll try and go through these vignettes at a brisk pace, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions, um, so that way I can at least cover some of the subject matter and give you guys a flavor for how these technologies are being used. So my lab is interested um, broadly uh, in heart failure and cancer. Um, and um, the motivation in the context of heart failure comes when you look at the contractility of an adult cardiac myocyte. This movie will play again. What you're looking at the screen is a single um, isolated adult rat cardiac myocyte that we uh, isolate from adult rat hearts. And to me, this is a beautiful integrated machine. All it does is from birth to death, it goes about contracting in this dimension. And the whole cell is organized to achieve this one function. But of course, this function um, is modulated in the context of when you want it in the context of physiology. We want a fight or flight response, whether you want to run faster, slow down when you sleep. So you have to be able to modulate the contractility of the system at multiple levels. And needless to say, when this modulation goes astray, you have heart disease. So I'm showing an example here uh, from an adult human uh, non-failing heart. This is what the myocyte would look like. And this is to scale the same myocyte from a failing heart of someone who has um, cellular hypertrophy, so left ventricular hypertrophy. And the idea is that the cell, in response to the pressure overload that someone like this would have, remodels itself to adjust its size so as to accommodate the increased back pressure on the heart. Um, despite the fact that the heart can grow in size, you would expect to get more contractility, but in fact, you'll end up getting diminished contractility. This is showing force, uh, force time curves um, uh, from hearts where you see a heart and heart failure. You have a diminished peak force. So something's going on in the context of the inside of the cell, uh, despite its appearance being similar, and in fact, even augmented in the context of hypertrophy. Um, millinewton per millimeter squared. I know it's a sort of a weird yeah, unit. It's a uh, SI unit for force. 
Yeah, it's an SI unit. Uh, well, not even if you would have to have, have put it at meter cubed if you wanted to mm -hmm. be precise SI. Um, also, um, some of the mutations that are commonly found in uh, proteins in the sarcomere, that's the uh, contractile machinery of the heart, they lead to ultrastructural changes. So here you have a wild type heart, um, and this is just showing um, you know, histology staining, and these black dots are nuclei. This is this nice striated pattern you get. And in the context of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy mutations, you see sort of um, disarray at the structural level that's happening. And that's reflected, in fact, in the variation in thick filament distance. So this is not just something that happens um, between cells, but happens at the level of the molecules that are organizing the contractile apparatus inside the cell. So what, what causes all this um, in the context of these changes that we see? And then we come to something like this, which uh, most people are familiar when they look at cell signaling, which is the spaghetti-like intermixing of different networks and a lot of the usual players, G-protein coupled receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, TGF beta, TNF alpha. And the difficulty is that um, in drug discovery for heart failure is that um, while people have over the decades picked out individual components and tried to target them, they have to do so in the context of the complexity that the network presents to them. And so the reason that there haven't been tremendous advances in therapeutics for heart disease is because things are interconnected, so there's functional redundancy um, built into the system, and also you cannot perturb certain things without having adverse side effects. And of course, I'm putting this in the context of heart failure, but something very similar would present itself in cancer or any other disease state that's happening. So our main point is that diseases emerge from changes, subtle changes in signaling networks. And so rather than try and look for new targets using genetic screens, which is one way of going about trying to find a silver bullet that would essentially circumvent this network and give you uh, a specific target, we're trying to look at sort of some of the old players that have been well implicated in cardiac disease and see if there are subtle things that are changed about them that would essentially be different between normal and disease. What do I mean by subtle changes? So here's an example. Uh, here's a G-protein coupled receptor. This is one of a family I'm showing adrenergic receptors. And in the last 10 years, people have really begun to appreciate that in response to different stimuli, um, the same G-protein coupled receptor can activate different G-proteins. And so in the context of the beta adrenergic receptor, which I'm going to talk about, a switch from S to I would switch the contractility from stimulatory to inhibitory and essentially prevent you from getting the additional contractility that you want to essentially compensate for the failing heart. And this essentially the hypothesis in the field now is these are subtly different conformations of the same protein. So you can look at the same receptor that's been studied and targeted for several years. If you can understand these conformations, presumably we can get a hint as to how to target them. Another example that's very common in signaling networks is the same protein without changing its expression or phosphorylation pattern. So you won't see it in RNA-seq, chip-seq, or phosphorylation levels, but will go and target different things in the normal state versus the disease state. PKC-alpha, sort of a central node in a lot of diseases, or its isoforms, uh, central nodes in a lot of diseases, uh, it can go and phosphorylate connexin 43 that's located in one compartment, phospholamban in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or uh, target ERK-12, uh, ERK your uh, classic MAP kinase that goes into the nucleus. So different functions of the same protein. And then again, you have convergence of elements. But basically, you could have PKC activate ERK-12, but you could also have something like focal adhesion kinase, that's a mechanosensitive protein, also activate ERK-12. So if we can understand how these components in the network are sort of put together and how they function in the context of the network, presumably we can learn something along the way that would give us a, um, a handle into how to target them in disease states. You know, so I used to work on this system many years ago with Bruce Carlson when he was chair down there. And uh, wrote a couple of papers. And you know, one of the things that we, we would, I made these 3D images of these myocytes and then, you know, would count, did a study like that science one maybe 10 years earlier, you know, where we were looking at the nuclei and so on. And so I'm fascinated, but it's a multi-nucleated cell. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and so I guess my 
question is, how do the various nuclei, and you showed the one histological picture of the yeah. normal versus the disrupted, how do these nuclei, you know, and, and what they control in their little environment, if you will, you know, uh, what, how do they, uh, how, does, how does what they, happens in the nuclei, uh, you know, what's their span of control and how, is there any interaction between various nuclei, all this kind of stuff? Because it's kind of interesting that there's so many of them. Um, I mean, that's kind and of... And then what really is the cell? Yeah, that's uh, that's unrelated to the kind of questions we ask. But what I can say is that the turnover rate for sarcomatic proteins is finite. It's not non-existent. In, uh, so first of all, people um, to date, unless you have injury, you don't change the number of myocytes. So the myocytes are, you know, very long-lived cells. But the sarcomatic proteins tend to turn over in the order, I think, generally established in the order of a few days. Uh -huh. So the nucleus is important in terms of maintaining transcription and uh, propagating protein, but not at the rate that you would have in a normal and dividing cell. So there's cell. a sarcolemma that's uh, yes. associated with, you know, the, so each nucleus has a little sarcolemma component that Absolutely. they're associated with? Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, I think that these are sort of difficult questions that people have tried to answer uh, just because of how densely packed these components are, uh -huh. that the sheer density of it becomes difficult even any any sort of microscopy technique including electron microscopy has failed to provide adequate resolution of what's going on most of the things are associative when you sort of start perturbing genes and looking at function that we have some insight so i don't have too much more insight into than what i've just said uh -huh. thanks um so then i talked about uh you know inherited cardiomyopathies in the context of cardiac myocyte we also study muscle protein myosin where uh, you could have mutations in the proteins and those could uh, essentially lead to deficiencies in contractility. The point I'm highlighting here is that inherently the my cardiac myocyte is integrated because by virtue of the fact that um, all of these myosin heads and all the machinery that goes into contractility has to function in unison. So just as you have the signaling network sort of um, working as a network, you have all these interactions also functioning as a network. And if I have time, I will try and uh, point to a study that we just published about um, how to study coordinated function. So in my lab, we've kind of focused on uh, a, a three or four molecules in, in different contexts. And I want to provide um, vignettes of how we've used new technology to this, because it's a technology form. And so we've, we've been studying uh, these molecules. And of course, these molecules have been really thoroughly studied by a lot of different groups. There's a lot of structural information. What is it that we are trying to contribute? Uh, the contributions we're trying to make are, or the questions we're trying to answer are framed in the context of the subtleties of how these molecules function. So how do we approach it? So the top down, we approach it using an ERK linker. And the ERK linker, uh, we came across it somewhat serendipitously um, during my postdoctoral work, where um, people had uh, showed this myosin. So what I'm showing you here is a single actin filament. And a, 200, oh, wow. and a 200 myosin walking along an actin filament. And what you see as the movie plays is rear head release, front head stroke. Rear head release, front head stroke. And um, safe to say, one of the uh, quandaries when you were studying this molecule is that it, when you would study it in a single molecule assay, we would see that it takes really long steps along an actin filament. And we were running out of structure to explain how you would get long steps. And then we came across this green noodle-like structure that you see connecting the two catalytic domains. And what this structure essentially does is that it has a unique function in the sense that in the cytosol, shown in the center, this molecule is sort of in a folded back state as a monomer. So the purple structure or the magenta structure folds back and interacts with the catalytic head. And then what we think happens is that when this molecule, this is an unconventional myosin, I should have pointed that out, uh, and it's involved in trafficking of membranes. Um, it unfurls, binds to an adapter protein uh, shown in uh, orange here on the vesicle, and then it allows for those long steps that we see. Um, but this interaction has to be regulated, so whatever structure we glue between the magenta and the gray structures, they have to, it has to have structural flexibility. We can't have all of these yellow rigid structures in between, otherwise you wouldn't be able to achieve this folded back state. And so the linker, we think, regulates this interaction um, here, this intramolecular interaction, so that it can be intramolecular in solution and then more intramolecular on the context, in the context of the dimer. 
So what makes this unique? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I think I, uh, I think that it, it, uh, it, it, it we think it's an inhibitory mechanism. There's some evidence, but again, these uh, I, I wouldn't want to say it like forcefully because there's, there's still some controversy. This is sort of our model right now. But we definitely have a SAC structure that shows that it exists in this sort of bound back state. We definitely have evidence for an interaction here. Um, the positive role of this is to kind of keep the motor in check. So it, in the absence of this cargo, it doesn't go latch on and do uh, continuously function. But directly, it's been difficult to show. Certainly, one last thing I can say is that when it's in this inhibited state, it's much less processive than it is in this unfurled state. So that's kind of supportive evidence, but not conclusive. Um, so this is a you know sort of potentially bioinformatics audience, so you can appreciate the, um, the structural layout. I mean the sequence layout here. What what I'm showing you here is that when we found this uh, sequence in the myosin protein, we just went back and did a simple bioinformatics search, and we found that um, a variety of different proteins um, uh, and in a variety of different species have the similar sequence repeat in them. And what's unique about this is that it's basically um, about four E residues uh, followed by four K or R residues. And it's not quite four four, it happens to be four plus three, which happens to be seven, and seven is 3.5 times two, which happens to be um, the repeat sequence for the Linus Pauling helix. And that's kind of interesting because when you do a molecular dynamic simulation and you fold this structure de novo, what you find is that the side chains uh, the glutamic acids and the lysines, they sort of play kiss and tag with each other. So because they're sort of packed and they are in that three plus, uh, uh, four plus three configuration, you get sort of an additional structural stabilization of what would otherwise be an unstable structure in polar solvent. Um, obviously, because there's water molecules all around, um, these, these uh, salt bridges are not going to be stable, <laughs> but they have nowhere to go, so that essentially you would see this bouncing interaction happening, and you see two distinct peaks as you essentially get water coordinating in between the two. Um, the point is that this allows the structure to be relatively more stable than other alpha helices. Then you ask yourself, why hasn't the structure been um, mined before? It just turns out that this is um, also very similar in sort of structure prediction to a coil coil. So a coil coil also would have a lot of charge on the outside to solvate it. But this molecule, this sequence, essentially lacks the A and D position repeats. So the classic A and D position repeats are not conserved. And up to about, in our hands, when we've taken these proteins and put them in as high as um, two, 300 micromolar concentration, we don't see any evidence for formation of any sort of dimer between the proteins. There is a little bit of um, uh, controversy still in that, in that some people suggest that when uh, you put two proteins at the end and you may potentially bring them together, it might zip up to form a dimer. But so far, we've not been able to come up with any evidence for any high affinity dimerization, nothing like the coil coils that you see in most proteins where the structure natively falls into a coil coil. So, that, so this is kind of interesting. What, does it, um, what, what can we do with this? So because of the example from myosin, we decided to just um, use that information and see whether we can regulate interactions between proteins in a sort of systematic way. And that gave, this, uh, gave rise to this quirky name, systematic protein affinity strength modulation, or SPASM. Um, and uh, you can see the, uh, what we did is we basically took, uh, in our first study, we took calmodulin and peptide and essentially had a single polypeptide gluing the two together. And then we wanted to study the dynamics of this interaction, so we put uh, two fluorescent, a fluorescent uh, donor and acceptor at the two ends. And the idea is that we could then uh, build a very simple threat sensor where we would have no interaction open uh, and a lot of interaction closed. And this is one very simple application, very ground zero application of this, because one of the nice things is that this structure spans really long distances. I'm not showing you the data, but uh, um, a 10 nanometer um, length along the backbone helix is about eight nanometers in solution by SACS. So it's a very long protein structure, 80 angstroms long. A 20 is about 15 nanometers, and a 30 nanometer linker is about 22 nanometers. So it's pretty long. And it gives you a structural element that allows you to not only regulate the interaction, but also space proteins far apart. And this works really well. We've built a lot of different threat sensors using this 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think you set me up for my next slide. Um, so what, what we did is we, um, we went ahead and uh, measured the on rate and the off rate of protein-protein uh, interaction. The way we measured the on and off rates was just basically add two proteins that interact with each other and then add in a uh, dark protein to compete off the interaction and then do that in a stop flow. So basically we can see how the interaction, which rate constants are affected. And what it turns out is that if you put two proteins at the end of this linker, the off rate is specific to the particular protein-protein interaction, but the on rate is dependent on the length of the helix. What I'm showing you here is sort of the conformational states that this structure would adopt in solution from a Monte Carlo simulation. And what this allows us then to do is then characterize the effective concentration of two proteins at the ends of the linker. And what we find is um, that as you increase the length of the linker, 10 to 20 to 30, um, you essentially go by log orders of magnitude, decrease in the effective concentration of the 2NC in the intramolecular interaction. Uh, just as a sort of note for people who are thinking of using this, this is not, even though it sounds big, a 10 nanometer linker length is only 10 kilodaltons of protein, 20 is 20 kilodaltons of protein, 30 is 30 kilodaltons of protein. So even with the longest linker. Yeah, that's convenient. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, Right. Uh, and then what's also nice is that this, is, this interaction concentration, this, this effective concentration is now being decoupled from the solution um, bimolecular interaction in that regardless of the dissociation constant, the effective concentration really depends on the length of the linker. And so by varying the length of the linker, we can vary the strength of the interaction in a sort of systematic way and perturb individual interactions inside cells. Yes. Yes, we can measure the, vary the K on. And I'll, I'll show you uh, quick examples of where we've used this in different contexts. So uh, in, in the, to specifically point to your point, we can vary the K on and we can actually see an effect of enzyme activity in cells. So um, the first example we turned to, um, and it was sort of fortuitous because Michigan's really good at GPCRs, um, is looking at the beta-2 adrenergic receptor uh, the positive model is that in normal, I mean, under normal conditions, and this is well established, it's a canonical GS coupled receptor leading to increase in cyclic AMP. There have been multiple reports, although it's still controversial, that on, in heart failure uh, conditions, uh, the same receptor in response to stimulation will now go through an inhibitory pathway. And if this switch happened, this could explain why you would be able to still get stimulation of the heart, but not get increase in contractility. Of course, when you have sustained signaling, you would then um, desensitize the receptor through arrestance. So um, right about the time when we started the study, this uh, crystal structure paper came out where we could see the GPCRG protein interface. And multiple people have studied this interface in great detail even before the crystal structure arrived. And um, they've, they've continuously seen that this C-terminal alpha helix from the G-alpha subunit inserts itself into a groove that's made in the GPCR. And so we decided to use the G-alpha subunit as a bait to see whether we can detect GPCR confirmations using our system. Um, before this, of course, I should point out that other people have attempted to look at different confirmations of the GPCR. The point here is not to overwhelm you with data, but to simply point out that this has been done in different contexts using FRET. Um, oh. Oh, go ahead. Uh, using FRET, using um, uh, you know a mass spectroscopy, uh, and also with NMR, and the idea is that basically we can. They've used different techniques, and they've seen different confirmations of the same GPCR. The difficulty is, in order to understand what these confirmations mean, you have to turn to downstream assays, and the moment you turn to downstream assays, you have to deal with that complexity of intersection of different components that regulate the network. So we decided to bypass that and build a very simple system where this is the first example I'm demonstrating of using the system, where you basically put this module in. And um, as a note for people who are listening, the idea is that all of our elements, protein elements, are cloned between, between unique restriction sites. So you can pop out and pop in any protein of interest into the system. This is the full GPCR. Then you have a, a fluorescent acceptor. Um, you have this um, you know, linker. Uh, think of it as a fly fishing rod, and then you have a, um, a donor, and then you have this peptide from the G-alpha subunit, which is like a bait. So think of this as a fly fishing rod where the uh, peptide is being fired at the receptor, 
at a constant rate. If the receptor adopts a confirmation that sort of mimics the confirmation for a particular G subunit, you would essentially trap this state, and then you would have an increase in threat because you'd have a higher residence time in this state. Um, you know, I think it'd be good to describe threat for a minute because I bet you everybody here doesn't know what that is. Uh, okay, so thank you for pointing that out. So let me take a couple of slides back just to introduce threat in this context. Um, threat refers to uh, Forster's, uh, Forster's, or now it's being called fluorescence resonance energy transfer, but basically, you have a donor fluorophore, uh, typically um, a blue fluorophore, uh, and then you have um, a yellow fluorophore, in this case, an acceptor fluorophore, YFP. The idea is that you excite this molecule and you get this color uh, emission. And then, but if the two of them are in proximity of each other, you had resonance energy transfer from this to that. And so you have a spectral shift that you can detect using a fluorometer, just to um, clarify that. And the magnitude of the spectral shift is indicative of how much is in this state relative to that state. Very good. Thank you um, for pointing that out. So we can detect the high fret versus the low fret configuration. Um, I want to just, uh, I mean, this is, this is a study that we published. There's a lot of different observations, but I just want to point, point a highlight from the study, which is now we're looking at this uh, in the context of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And one interesting finding when we screened a bunch of molecules is this beta blocker that's prescribed uh, commonly for heart failure and hypertension, metaprolol. Uh, it's a fairly commonly prescribed beta blocker. Uh, the fact that it's a beta blocker means that it binds to the receptor and suppresses signaling from it. And you would expect that because this is an S-coupled receptor. You would expect it to decrease in S, and that's a sort of a classic response for this beta blocker. But what was surprising to us is that not only did it shut down signaling from S, that is, it's essentially removing a foot off the accelerator, but it's also started pressing the brake, in which case it's actually creating confirmations that are sensitive to GI. And this observation was made by FRET. It's not found in all cases. This is the unique to metaprolol. Um, this is all in live cells um, using a photometer that we do these assays, so there's no perturbation. The protein isn't suspended in a uh, fat cloud. It's actually in live HEC-293 cells. And then we can see a nice dose-dependent increase in FRET. And more importantly, when we pick something up like this from our preliminary, you might call this like a screen, we can see that in a more traditional assay where the GI-coupled um, proteins are pertussis toxin sensitive. So you can see that um, you get a certain amount of in inhibition by adding this beta blocker, and that inhibition is lost when you treat it with pertussis toxin. Um, the main point here, even if you don't completely understand it, is that what we see using our FRET-based assay has, can be confirmed by using whatever the gold standard assay is in the field. And so this allows us, at the level of confirmation of the receptor, to parse different confirmations. And this becomes an important tool, and then now we're collaborating with multiple labs to try and uh, look at receptors, particular receptors of interest, and also we're trying to see if we can build this more towards a, a primary screen in the context of drug discovery. I'll give another example, just because we, again, in a, in a tool seminar, how do we use these technology and tools? The previous one was a fairly simple example because you're just using, uh, building a, a, a modified FRET-based sensor, and other people have built, built FRET-based sensors. What the fly fishing rod in the, in the G-protein coupled receptor gives you is the ability to separate the fluorophores in the ground state so that you get low FRET to high FRET, and you get a very nice clean transition. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about modulating protein interactions in cells. And this is modulating, not just monitoring. And so, um, you know, it's fairly typical in cells that you find macromolecular complexes like this. So this is the focal adhesion network. This is uh, what cells, uh, like suction pods that cells put down to allow them to stick to the surface. And this is a, at least a, a partial list, um, it's changing and evolving, of proteins that have been uh, mapped by different investigators, by a variety of different groups that essentially interact. So each line here is a interaction that someone has mined, um, you know, say in a chromium precipitation or a yeast to hybrid. And this is what this map looks like. And you see these hubs in this, which is focal adhesion kinase and also protein kinase C. We'll come to that later. And the question then becomes, um, looking at something like focal adhesion kinase, when it undergoes so many different interactions, how, does, how is it actually performing its function? How is it coordinating all these interactions to perform its function? So is this ingenuity output? I mean, where does this come 
I don't know. Um, this is definitely, uh, this is from a nature cell biology paper where they had this map. Um, that's not within my area of expertise. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and the the idea here, um, the idea here is that you can modulate focal adhesion kinase function. We just published this. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but just highlight the the tool itself. And the idea is that most kinases, and focal adhesion kinase is no exception, have auto inhibitory domains that clamp on to the kinase domain. So this is the kinase domain in orange in the left and the firm domain in, the, in blue on the right. And they're linked together. They kind of have a high intramolecular uh, interaction um, that's happening, and that sort of masks the catalytic active site and su suppresses the kinase. So something's got to break this interaction when it goes onto the focal adhesion in order to release this kinase, and that also keeps it in check in solution. So what we can do, and uh, what we did in the study is basically we can suture in green this linker in between. And then we can, as we vary the length of the linker, we would expect to op pry open the molecule and therefore increase the activity of this kinase. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm showing you just uh, sample data where we've been made one of these, uh, made these constructs. We transfect them into cells or we can make stable lines. And the nice thing is that depending upon the length of the link, sorry, depending upon the length of the linker, so you go 10, 20, 30, you have a variation in FRET. So even though this protein is located in that complex mesh, the linker essentially maintains that interaction uh, and two different cell types. And you might say, okay, that's interesting, but what does that mean for function? You can modulate a downstream phosphorylation event. You grind up these cells and do a phospho phosphorylation. Independent of expression, you can modulate that particular phos uh, a key phosphorylation event based on the length of the linker. And that again is a 10, 20, 30 right here. And so that's kind of nice. Now it gives you a, a, a way to dial in the um, uh, kinase function in cells. And because this phosphorylation site happens to be critical for migration of cells, we can control how fast cells move just by, by varying that one parameter, just as var by varying that one interaction inside cells. So basically, again, we're looking at how wound closure here. And then what we can see is that, um, and there's more extensive data, I'm just giving an example of it, uh, in 3T3C cells where you don't have a linker, the two domains are really close to each other, we again see as we keep adding the linker, we start decreasing the speed with which the cells migrate. So same level of protein expression, just one interaction, same two domains, no mutagenesis of the domains themselves, just varying linkers in between, you can actually vary the rate at which cells grow. Uh, sorry, cells migrate. So what this allows us to do, using the linker is a systematic tool to then say, is this particular protein interaction important in this process? Rather than knock out things or express things, you can just vary the interaction strength. So rather than have an all or nothing, you just vary the interaction strength and ask, does this lead to a change in function? And this is one example, and we've been working with some groups to try and um, use this in different systems. That's a really good idea. Um, uh, I, we've thought of it in a different context, um, and um, uh, uh, we started a collaboration with Kristen Berhe, who's next door. And uh -huh. what they've done is something similar, where uh, they have a story that's coming out where they've, instead of using antibodies, mm -hmm. they use domains. So you have a three-part system where you have A, B, A, and C that have a domain, and let's say you have a split GFP that spontaneously mm -hmm. complements, and the other one is, say, uh, you know, an EF hand protein that, again, to, uh, uh, let's say, a, a heterodimer. So you express the three components in cells, and then you have this linker grab onto those two proteins and then link it. Totally. It's been done, and it's a, a study that they have coming out, and they've been using this system that way. I'll also point out, this is uh, not published. Uh, uh, we have a collaboration um, with um, a group out in Caltech where they basically use the antibody strategy not to essentially get the proteins to interact, but to get higher affinity of binding. So let's say you had two binding interfaces. One would bind, 
And because the first one binds, the second one would bind with higher affinity by spatial proximity, you'd get it to bind better. Not only that, what's nice about that system is that the linker is long, so especially when you want to get synergies and interaction in macromolecular complexes, you can reach long distances. So if you had like a ribosomal complex and you wanted two proteins to come and interact at two different parts of the interface, you can take, you can take advantage of the long linker to not only control the interaction, but also how far you can reach. And everything is, uh, what's nice about the system for us is um, everything is sort of one plasmid because everything is encoded by a single gene product. So we can easily make stable lines. We've been doing that. Um, you can transiently transfect. You can make it in insect cells, uh, bacterial expression vectors. And for anyone who's interested in playing around with this, we have it in all kinds of configurations of fluorophores and proteins and linkers, and we're welcome to share it. And we have um, an ad gene database that's already uh, pretty substantial where we have posted a lot of these. So for people who are not in Michigan, can definitely you know, uplink any of these. We have plasmid maps. People can just throw in their proteins and start studying them. Well, you're giving away all the secrets of my lab. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've been trying. We, we just started meddling around to see if we can use something like a love domain um, to essentially optogenetically, quote unquote, manipulate, um, use a high profile term. Uh, to, to use, a, to use a, another system, orthogonal system, to essentially break the linker in a um, ligand-dependent manner. Yeah. So uh, I don't know that it's worked yet. Uh, in the DNA field, that's certainly been used very well. They call them actuators, where basically a second strand essentially causes it to forces it to collapse. Um, and so this is, to me, this is a, a big picture point. Is this is a nice interface between something like DNA nanotechnology and protein uh, biotechnology because. This gives you sort of the spanners and the tools and the rods that you need in the protein space because you can't introduce DNA nanotech into the cell. Um, at least you can, but it's, it's harder to control it. Oh, you mean in the, in, in the context of the, mo of the native molecules themselves? Um, well, we, we've, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is an interesting point. Um, I oh, should, yeah, you probably you don't use the mic when you do the questions. Yeah. So I think uh, there's an interesting point to that question, which actually is why we went down cell signaling in the first place. Oh, okay. The question was, um, is there any information... Um, that we can gain about, because we can modulate the association rate, can we show potentially that a particular process is dependent on association rate or is limited by association rate? I think, I, I can't answer that question directly, but I will redirect it to a different point, which is that what got us into cell signaling in the first place is the range of concentrations that we can actually get with the linker. And that happens to be about 10 micromolar to about 100 nanomolar. And why is that important? Because most interactions in cell signaling are fairly transient. You don't want things that essentially glue and bind and never come off. That would be nanomolar. You don't want things that are millimolar because you may not even know that it's an interaction. Most transient interactions, which with finite off rates, happen in this regime. Um, Barry's question is well taken, though. That would be a useful thing to try and test. I wouldn't know how I would be able to then make an argument that that actually reflects the physiology, though. And that's a criticism one can easily get. So I think the signaling systems would be great to go after. Right? Yeah, that's or exactly what we've been. Limited. Yep. And we're finding that a lot of the interactions in, uh, in cell signaling, they're fairly transient. And so our linker um, tends to bracket a little bit higher and a little bit lower than what the cell provides. This is another question that someone could ask is, and we, we get often is, how does this compare to what the cell would provide? And it tends to be that in a native context, when we measure this by using downstream output, the highest linker would be maybe a couple of fold higher than what the cell would provide, and the lowest linker would be a couple of fold lower than what the cell would provide. So it nicely brackets and allows you that sensitivity knob that you were looking for to modulate the interaction. Um, let me see, how are we doing on time? I, 10 minutes. So um, let, me, uh, let me 
illustrate this example because this is now getting into uh, what I used to love as a child, which is Lego and, and uh, uh, Technic, and which is like, how do you use the system? How do you leverage the system to really start taking apart these uh, um, goliaths of the field, which are these multi-domain proteins that are typically intractable to crystallography and also to NMR. And of course, uh, you know, uh, we have excellent uh, cryo, -EM, cryo EM person here, Yerko, um, and you know, beginning to come under the traction of something like cryo EM. But the difficulty with these proteins, and PKC is a nice example of it, is it has 10 different domains. And, and, and these domains are separated by very flexible linkers. And the idea is that when you look at how much complexity is built at the, at the sequence level into PKC versus our current model of PKC, it just does not match up in the sense that we think PKC in the cytosol exists like a blob like this, um, where all the domains are sort of latched onto each other. And then in response to small molecule stimuli, the individual domains uh, in a specific sequence uh, come off, and then they unfurl this kinase domain, which is then free to go on and phosphorylate its downstream targets. Um, just as a, a zoom out, because this, um, th this becomes more relevant, not only for PKC, but other kinases. PKCs belong to the AGC family of kinases. There are 60 different kinases shown on the left here, and the PKC family is boxed in red. The point I'm trying to make is that there are conserved domains, but the modular domains keep getting switched around. Um, and of course, this is just highlighting that this, the, you know, a lot of the kinases that are implicated in um, homeostasis and disease fall into this uh, family, and this family accounts for one-fifth of the kinases in the kinome. Um, one of the difficulties in understanding how to perturb these kinases comes when you actually see the catalytic site. This is 14 different AGC kinases, crystal structures just pulled out from uh, published structures, and you align them and you begin to realize how difficult it is going to be um, to find minor differences in the catalytic sites to target them. And most people who have used kinase inhibitors know that how concentration you use them essentially predisposes you to all kinds of problems. And there's wealth of literature that confuses people where people don't know whether it's a specific effect or not. But the sequence secret lies, in my opinion, in the modular domains. And uh, this has been posited by Wendell Lim's group at UCSF in that the idea is very simple and elegant, that modular domains represent an evolutionary balance. So rather than design a new domain to do catalysis, and catalysis is very difficult to come across, you just simply start suturing domains in a mix and match fashion to achieve function. And that makes sense because if you wanted to get a kinase that's, say, regulated by SH2, um, in this case, potentially by SARC signaling, you would essentially glue those two together. And this is pretty nice, and, but this essentially takes away some of the sophistication. So let's say you did a bioinformatics search and you found that a protein had these domains in it. Uh, you'd be inclined to think that you can ascribe function based on the fact that you know these domains. But sequence of domains is known to matter, and the interaction between domains is also known to matter. So uh, I'll, I'll highlight this in the context of PKC, where the story gets even more complicated, in that PKC has now been known to homodimerize. So for example, um, in 1999, people used cross-linking to show that when you activate PKC using its canonical activators in vitro, uh, you have nice dimerization of PKC. In a concentration-dependent way, a different group showed that you have this really nice inflection point right at about one nanomolar where the activity just races off in a concentration-dependent manner. So this would suggest to you that PKC dimerizes, but it's been ignored by the field even though it's been published because how do you dissect the dimerization interface and therefore convince yourself that this is a real phenomenon? And also, you have 10 distinct domains with potential cooperativity and interaction. So one way is to just put off this story until you get a crystal structure, but as people have tried and failed, because of so many domains and so much complexity, this is probably not going to happen, potentially with CryoEM, but again, potentially in the future. So I'm showing you a quick example where this dimerization phenomenon, when we first started working with these sensors, we believe this is real. So basically, here you have a sensor, a very simple sensor, but basically you have a FRED donor and acceptor at either end of the molecule. Uh, and we would expect that because the molecule is folded in based on the SAC structure, it would be inactive and it would have high FRED. If it unfurls, according to the structural proposition, the domains would move too far away and you would have a decrease in FRET. When we put this into cells and stimulate it with a physiological effector that activates PKC, here's what you see. On the left, what you're seeing 
um, is a fluorescence image. And what you see as the movie repeats is the protein goes to the basal lateral membrane. On the right, what you see is a cell that responds. And not all cells respond because not all cells have the receptor. You actually see an increase in threat as opposed to a decrease in threat, a complete opposite shift as what you would expect. And so the threat response is not consistent with the model. Um, we said, OK, sorry. Uh, and we said, OK, you know, maybe this is an artifact of clustering on the lipid surface. And that has been posited, too. So we just make the protein in vitro. And then we see the same effect. So I'm showing you a threat spectrum. The peak at 475 is a donor peak. The peak at 525 is the acceptor peak. And basally, you have some threat, which is expected. But in, when you activate it with calcium and PMA or calcium and phosphatidylserine and diacylglycerol, you see an increase in threat. Notably, calcium and PMA, both are soluble molecules at these concentrations. So this is not happening by clustering on the lipid surface. And also, the concentration of protein is remarkably low. It's 15 nanomolar. We say, OK, maybe that's an intramolecular conformational sensor. Why don't we move to an intermolecular system? We can do that and show that in an intermolecular system, where one fluorophore is on, the, on one molecule, second fluorophore is on the other molecule, again, we see the same effect, a really nice increase in threat at low concentrations. Um, this is not happening simply by clustering. If you were to take a membrane-bound protein, just a domain by itself, and put it in with calcium and PMA, you would, wouldn't get that effect that you see with PKC. Calcium and PMA alone, when you put it on a lipid membrane, you do get some increase in threat, but that's nowhere near what you would expect, what you see with PKC. So again, are attesting to the fact that this is potentially not their effective clustering. You can do it in reverse. You can competitively inhibit the threat by essentially, I'm showing you threat ratio as a function of concentration. And I'm showing you an inverse so that you can see that you're competing this off. What was really interesting is when you calculate out the partitioning, this shows up with a nanomolar affinity. And this is a classical PKC, what we think we completely understand and know everything about, um, and has been studied for a long time now appears to be a dimer rather than a monomer. So this kind of changes our way of thinking about this. The difficulty is, how do you now even approach this problem with all these domains and all this complexity? So you can do the 101 experiment, which is basically start deleting domains, which is what most people do. You start taking off different domains. So you remove the C1 domain, threat goes away. You take away the C tail, which is just a band around the kinase domain, threat goes away. You take the C2 domain off, threat marginally decreases. So this is telling you that this is potentially a complex interface. It is not going to be a point residue or a mutation. And we've tried, believe me, to try and break this interaction, and it doesn't fall off. So what we do instead, and this is where our, our linker really allows us to get some leverage, um, is that we can take this module and start dropping it in between different sites. So you can take the module, and what I'm showing you in one, two, three configurations is just separate two domains in the context of the native molecule by this uh, FRET probe so that if there's an interaction in a particular configuration, you would expect to see an increase in FRET. So for example, when we put in configuration one between the pseudosubstrate and the C1 domain, we see no FRET um, that's in here. But when we put it between one in the position two or position three, we see an increase in threat. Uh, I don't want to go through the, the details of how we did this, except to point out that the, all of this data is consistent with sort of an anti-parallel association between the molecules, where the catalytic domain of one interacts with the regulatory domain of the other. You'd say, OK, if all of this is really true, why haven't people seen these bimolecular interaction? It turns out that. These interactions, are there are multiple interactions, and they're weak. So if you were to start studying the interaction between the catalytic domain and the regulatory domain alone, it actually decreases in strength when you activate the molecule, which is what gives rise to the canonical model. It's just that when you add these interactions in the context of an interface, they become a nanomolar affinity interaction. I'm giving you one more example for the linker, and then we're going to stop. This is probably about what they should be for the function. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just want to give one more slide because I know I'm running out of time in just to highlight how you could use this system. And this is showing that there I was showing you an intramolecular system. You can break the system down even one more. So you put a really long linker and you put a fluorophore at each end. So now in the configuration, if, if all of this dimerizes and these two interact with each other, you can see that. 
if all of this dimerizes and these two interact with each other, you can see that. And so you see that effect in both of these cases. In other words, it's like it really is a complex interaction. That gives us sort of this model for the, what the dimer looks like. I want to leave you with one point because this is all fret and you may or may not believe it. And that is that I'm going to skip a bunch of slides and just pointing out that what we can do is when you get a crude model like this for the dimerization interface, you can get peptides from the, those interfaces and start perturbing dimerization. So for example, given that we think this is where the interfaces are, we can derive peptides from there. And then we put them in solution and the native peptide but not a scrambled peptide will inhibit the FRET response. And more importantly, a classic uh, PKC response is ERK12 that most people think of. You act, throw PMA on the cells, you get ERK12. We, we can actually show that the native peptide, which is only competing for the dimerization, it's not targeting the active site. We can put the peptide in solution, it will not affect the catalytic activity of the, of the protein of the kinase domain alone. It will completely abolish the PMA dependent response to ERK12. It's very effective. We're just taking the peptide, metastilating it, sprinkling it on the cells, and then you lose the ERK12 activation. And you can show, take a peptide from either the, um, uh, from the regulatory domain or a catalytic domain and do this. Importantly, you're only blocking the PKC specific response for the peptide because if you take something like serum, which is going to activate a whole bunch of pathways going to PKC, you don't compete off the serum response. So this is a PKC specific peptide that will allow you to, in a PKC specific manner, target modular domains outside the catalytic domain and perturb its function. I'm run out of time, so I'm going to stop just to kind of illustrate this point. And unfortunately, I have a lot more slides, so I'm going to have to skip through them, which is good for yeah, you guys. Yeah, but I just want to, um, you know, it's important to acknowledge the people who did the work. So this is my group at Michigan. Um, Rizal and Ruth are postdocs in my lab. Rabia and Carter are awesome graduate students, and my pseudo-tech, more like a graduate student, Mike Ritt, and uh, collaborators and funding sources, and thank you guys for your attention. I have questions here, Barry. Um, I noticed that you and Jim Spudich had a patent uh, on these linkers. Yeah, we do. That's neat. What would you do with it? Are you developing that? Yeah, so actually, um, you know, uh, the simple way of putting it is Stanford is much more aggressive at patenting things than Michigan. Um, and so Stanford approached us, the technology office approached us, and they filed a patent on our behalf. And they've been, uh, Jim. Jim, me, and Stanford co-owned the patent. Uh -huh. And basically, um, we've been um, targeting, they've, Michigan's technology office basically targets all the Bay Area companies to uh, farm out for interest for them to use this technology. So if we build something of our own, then we can obviously potentially do something with it uh, through that patent. But then there are there is some interest in that independently um, through pharmaceutical companies, right. where you'd be able to build these sort of sensor systems. Yeah. The patent is essentially designed to cover any sort of interaction you modulate using the link. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering whether you would, that sounds like a neat possibility for you. Uh, I mean, if you form these Well, I think that 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 is um, that is certainly down the line. I think what where we are at right now um, in terms of the the process of any technology is that we are really hitting as many examples as we can in signaling to really demonstrate and also convince ourselves that you know what what we see with regards to linker is really happening. And then in the next step from this is um, we have I don't, didn't have a chance to show you the data, but for PKC for example, we've been able to do small scaled screens where our system is able to pick up certain compounds that wouldn't show up in a traditional kinase screen. So this is sort of the, you know, the, the life of any sort of uh, technology. I think once we start publishing those which are coming off the line right now, I think that is already um, engaging interest from pharma in putting, um, you know, linking up with specific applications. Uh, the very simple example of that is um, PKC alpha and beta are closely related molecules. There's a putative beta-specific compound, ruboxastarin, which went through phase one, two, and three clinical trials from Lilly for uh, looking at um, diabetic complications in the eye. Uh, but it cannot distinguish, uh, but there's reports from Jeff Mulkenton's group that 
it does not distinguish between alpha and beta. And Jeff Mulkenton at Cincinnati says that alpha is a really should be viewed as a heart failure target, but we are building the assays that allow us to distinguish between closely related isoforms. This comes back to the point that it, the, the, those modular domains that I talked about and our ability to target them allows us to really differentiate between very closely related kinases because those sequences are not at all conserved. So that's where the real value for drug discovery is, is how do you target allostatically? And allostatic is big in, in, in general, but this is the kind of allostatic that I think people should be really paying attention to. And this is hidden because you, unless you really look for it, you're not going to find it. Yeah, we actually collaborate with David Antonetti. Uh -huh. Yeah, and uh, David and I are working with his Brex cells and uh, PKC beta as Good. we speak. Yeah, David's awesome. Yeah. I just want to say, the National Alliance, what's special about them right now? Do you know? Funding percentile. Bingo. 25 or something, I hear. The uh, highest flow funding line. So, you know, if you've got a way to send a grant into NAI, do it. Well, I think we need to find a specific application that would be of interest to them. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. And right now, um, the collaboration with Antonetti, I'm really happy about that because it's a very specific application that pertains to them. So we're not just being opportunists, but we are finding something that would be a real interface. That's the point. That's very good. Thank you. So, my some great case from start motor demand, all these motors that you cut your teeth on, right? Yeah. There's, you know, the conserved motor demand, just like the kinases. Lots yeah. Of variation outside that demand. Are you going to take it back that route? And uh, actually, it? yeah. Uh, I didn't have a chance to go through an entire study. But we, what, so the top down is ERK. The bottom up, we've been engineering cooperativity in myosins and studying coordination between motor domains using nanotechnology. Yeah. So that's the inter intersection that is coming up. Um, myosins are a very, um, uh, I think, um, They've been mined quite well. So I think just in terms of practical common sense, I think uh, there's a lot of signaling molecules that are just beginning to be scratched. And to me, AGC kinases are wide open. Or that's my perception. Probably the AGC field doesn't see, feel, see it that way. But um, Thank you. yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.